Hello there, and welcome to the Ask Time Film Podcast, where we talk film, TV, games, and all that jazz. Let us know tomorrow. This week, we are ranking all nine of Wes Anderson's films. My name is Tom, and as always, I'm joined with my co-host, John. Hey. How are you this week? I'm doing great. Just, you know, been watching Wes Anderson's film all week, uh, mm. but been, been a bit busy, but, you know, trying to make sure I can get this thing as well. But there's some couple of films that I, I can't even rank at, but it will be out in the side but Tom Tom will talk about those films but really I had a great week of watching them so yeah yeah that's absolutely fine I can I can talk about stuff um but yeah I'm actually in London right now so I am I'm recording this on location so I'm not got I don't have my usual setup of microphone I've got like my, I'm using my phone to record so you know apologies if this sounds a bit weird but we just give it a test run it sounds fine I think so so mm. yeah should we just get straight into it yeah let's get into it should we go in chronological order? I don't know the chronological order of the Wes Anderson films, but you can, you know, well, do it because you've got ranking, more knowledge than me. So, yeah, we'll do it. We're ranking. So, we'll go from our bottom placement to our top placement. And we'll do, if anyone's watched our rankings before, we kind of go like base by base. And then when, when we both hit the same film, then we talk about it. So, it's actually quite lucky because my number nine is Isle of Dogs, which I know is one of the ones that you didn't get to watch. Oh, oh, to rank. Oh, right. So, um, this might sound a bit weird, but my number nine is Rushmore. Okay. Well, that's that's actually yeah. No, that that's that that is completely understandable. So I'll talk about Isle of Dogs first because I know that's one that you haven't, and obviously you've got you've got yeah, seven, go not nine. So, and um, also, Isle of Dogs is. So first of all, Wes Anderson is my favorite director, like a hundred percent. There's no doubt about it. Um, and you know, we love it when a director's work gets like progressively better with each film. You know, like you you want to go to a new Wes Anderson film and it be their best film. But it's shame to say that Wes Anderson's most recent film before The French Dispatch is my least favorite, which really does suck. But by no means do I think it's bad. I think Isle of Dogs is wonderful. He takes all of the the right uh, lessons from Fantastic Mr. Fox. He uses the... It, it's a different kind of stop motion, but simply Mr. Fox is using similar techniques. And I think it works so well. I mean, as somebody who has a dog, loves dogs, I know many of them. I'm, I'm a dog whisperer. I mean, uh, I, mean <laughs> uh, I thought Isle of Dogs would be your top three but like wow no no dogs. um yeah um they they really they really nail the dogs like if obviously the cast is, is is wonderful but like all the dogs feel like you know a dog that you could encounter whether it be like a stray dog or a bit more of a kind of high society dog or just like you know your classic man's best friend dog and i think mm. it really really works it's it's a beautiful beautiful film set in japan so you've got these really it looks really nice visually um and, you know, there are loads of different elements, I think, work together. Obviously, Wes has many different, you know, styles that, you know, in terms of his aesthetics or his music. And I think it all comes together. My problem with it is, is that in the film, so I think it's fair to say minor spoilers for every single film we're going to discuss. But um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go into too much. Um, the film follows kind of two um, plot threads. One is of the dogs and one is of... Uh, this this school child trying to uncover a government conspiracy, which yes is as weird as it sounds. What? Um, yeah, right. Uh, it's played by Greta Gerwig, the Lord and Savior. Um, and my problem is, is that while they're both interesting and they're both really fun, they don't really kind of intersect enough, and so they kind of run along separately. And you don't really get enough of the government conspiracy stuff until the very end when they kind of the two plot lines converge. And I, and I would definitely call that a, a, a shortcoming of the film. And, and, that, and I think most of the films, I don't have many like plot problems with them. And that would, I think that would be my big, my big problem with it. So yeah, I Love Dogs, number nine. Um, let's move on to number eight then. Uh, or your number um, seven. So you said it's Rushmore. Uh, did, did, yeah, Rushmore. Do, do you want to talk about Rushmore? Well, Rushmore is my number eight. So yeah, it works. So come on. Yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Watch my, um, I watched this, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I didn't know it was just 
No, Wes Anderson for me, no. It was just like, the story was, I don't know, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, I'm not in, into like the huge, you know, Wes Anderson, you know, like the tropes of it, you know, like the conventions, like what he uses in this. But I felt the story was a bit weak in this one. Like it okay. didn't have that impact to me, but it just felt a bit on and off for me. Like some of the stories is there, but then some of the stories not there. But uh, Bill Murray, yeah, Bill Murray. Oh yeah, yeah. Bill Murray, uh, what a guy. Second. I mean, oh, this is the first one that he's done with Wes Anderson, yes. right? He was. Yeah. Fun fact: he was going to be in Bottle Rocket. Um, the uh, oh, I can't remember the, the the character's name, but you know the um the old guy who Dignan is like friends oh. with Mr. Something. That was going oh, to be right. he's the he's the dad out of elf. You'll know him as the dad out of elf. He oh, was going yeah, to be yeah. yeah, he was gonna be uh Bill Murray, but Bill Murray didn't uh, didn't do it at the time. Didn't because obviously uh I, I think I think he just didn't know Wes Anderson. And since then, since working with him, he's been every single one of Wes Anderson's films, which I think is really cool. Oh yeah but, um, yeah, but watching. Oh, yeah, go on. Did... Oh, okay. Um, I thought you know. Um, I mean, there was some really good stuff that uh, was in there in Rushmore, but I don't know. I just wasn't really connecting uh, connected with like some of the stuff that was there. Yeah, I wasn't really. Yeah, I can understand that. Well, okay. So as like the second Wes Anderson film, it hasn't really got all the tropes yet. You know, you yeah. don't have your kind of like four by three aspect ratio and and very yeah. specific framing that you would well, have in something like the Grand Budapest Hotel, which, you know, Rushmore still has very explicit, you know, and intentional framing, but it's not quite the same. Yeah. Uh, but especially, you know, like from Bottle Rocket to Rushmore, it's just felt so completely different, you know, you know what I mean? Yes. Like with the visual and, you know, aesthetic to it, like it was just completely bleak in Rushmore like it it just didn't have that you know stuff to it I mean it, it's his early days you know as a director you mm. know and, and this is the first uh, this is the second film he's doing but Bottle Rocket just you know really stood that you know uh, whole Wes Anderson well Bottle you know, Rocket was a Bottle Rocket was a flop like really obviously we yeah, Bottle Rocket flop. a little bit yeah, more later cinema. but it didn't it didn't do well at all um, and well, Rushmore was the first easy. kind of Oh yeah, Scott yeah. said you loved it. Thank God. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, Rushmore was the first kind of critical and commercial hit that Wes Anderson had. So, um, you know, we kind of owe a lot of what we see now in Wes Anderson's filmography to Rushmore. Um, it's definitely important because of that. And I, and I would argue that there are a lot of things that you can see Wes developing. Like there's a specific montage of Max, uh, who's mm. the main character, looking at all of the like it shows like all of the clubs that he's in you know what i mean yeah he's like yeah, president of this I mean. club and this club and that's a very kind of like wes anderson montage of like showing all the different things and you know you see yeah. it in in all of his films but what i appreciate so much about all of his films is that they're all different there isn't a single wes anderson film that is the same in any way and whether or yeah. not oh that's yeah a good thing or a bad like, thing um like it it's hilarious like like the the other films that I really thoroughly enjoyed was like um which I'll be talking about later in the ranking the Dark Dealing Limited the Life Aquatic yes. Yes. um Grand Budapest uh the uh what else well well I'll work it that uh, we are definitely gonna talk about um Tenenbaum oh Tenenbaums was very uh deep you know about mm. what the whole family situation you know uh what he's gonna do but that yeah I'm gonna talk about that one as well. Uh, but Fantastic Mr. Fox, yeah, that was, you know, completely different. You know, you, you wouldn't expect that yeah. from Wes Anderson, but the way he did it with the animation, you know, just completely there, you know, it really oh, fitted that I mean, whole... I'll, I'll, you know, as aesthetic. you say, we'll, we'll talk about it a bit later, but I would say that Fantastic Mr. Fox is one of the few perfect adaptations. Um, I yes. think the, the thing is, is that... Um, Oh, no, I lost my thought. No, wait, okay. Yeah. Oh. So Wes, you know, he wants his films to be different and he says he's never going to do a sequel. I think that's a good thing. You know, yes. obviously there, there are thematic um, links in every single one of his films, but but 
they're all so different in terms of you know they're set in different places and about different characters and different ages and you know they're, they're all exploratory different and i think that's so valuable for a filmmaker to have mm, yeah and you know i really appreciate you know directors decide to go to a different uh, approach in, in, in different films like you know um they can make something serious but also it's just that whole you know that genre you know, that caper genre you know like having that really uh um dry little, little bit dry humor but it's just hilarious like you know yes. football rocket, you know like um Owen Wilson's yeah yeah characters like wearing that tape over their nose and then he's yeah. like oh, oh um uh, like my nose was bleeding I don't know which one I think Anthony said that yeah Anthony was like oh my nose was bleeding the other day so I put a tape over it and it's like oh okay and the dry acting as well like it's like yes. really hilarious as well which is just like that whole so it adds to that whole you know uh, hilarity of the uh, Wes Anderson films um, definitely I, I think yeah. you know it, in terms of Rushmore my one of the things that I love the most about Rushmore is um, the kind of relationship between Herman and Max they both yeah. want to you know get the um approval and the mm. love of Miss I can't remember her name the, the other teacher and the way that they go about it like you know destroying each other's like lives essentially and I think what I love well, I'm going to say this so many times but there's so many things that I love about Wes Anderson's filmography but there is a motif of broken people and really narcissistic people. You know, you see it in Rushmore. Max is a huge narcissist. He says at one point, I saved Latin. What did you ever do? And it's like, you know, he believes himself to be the be all and end all and the person who's going to save so much of, you know, Rushmore and its kind of, uh, it, it's, its whole, um, oh, what's the word? I don't know the word, but he, you know, he feels like so much, you know, even though he's doing so badly in his classes, he feels like so mm. much depends on him. Uh, underachiever. Yeah, he is definitely an under, underachiever. Yeah. And Herman, um, as well, is a character who, you know, his marriage is failing and, you know, he's played brilliantly by Bill Murray. Um, um, and Bill Murray brings this kind of like dry, you know, kind of like exhaustion, like world weariness to him. Yeah. Like he's just, doesn't care anymore but the one thing that we found uh, hilarious um was well i saw this see at uh, the scene where uh bill murray uh bill, bill murray's character is you know introducing himself at washmore or i don't know it was that be at exactly beginning when um you know when the max is daydreaming you know sleeping yeah sleeping and dreaming yes. about like the success scene and like in class like <laughs> yes yeah. i can do this math like no one can do it um but that that's one of the really funny scenes is like um when max is introducing himself to bill murray's character and like saying oh wow i really i really admire you and then <laughs> the next thing is like oh who's that he's like that's max he's he's really smart and then it's like um oh he's not a good student <laughs> you know that whole yeah exactly um the juxtaposition uh, immediately yeah, and ex expectation for subversion, you know, like how mm. his films just really, you know, sub uh, we, uh, the whole uh, situation as well, like we're going to throw it, follow the protagonist, but then the protagonist is really, um, you know, we're finding more about it, but in a hilar hilarious way, you know, um, yeah. Definitely. I, I think if I was to give, so I, I think, you know, in terms of like the ranking, I would put Isle of Dogs at an eight out of ten, so very, very yeah, good. Yeah, I, I would, I would put Rushmore as a nine out of ten. I think I probably enjoyed it more than you. Um, yeah, but I, having I seen it, it twice now. Yeah, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say an eight or seven because I felt okay. okay there was some really good stuff, but I felt like that the story wasn't really getting me on. I think it's mm. just maybe the time of day or you know how I'm feeling, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think my, my big problem with it is at, at the end. Now, the ending, I think, is brilliant. Max stages a play, uh, which is uh, a, a Vietnam story. And it really oh, yeah. touches a nerve with Herman. And Herman starts to cry as a Vietnam vet himself. And I thought that was just so, so powerful. 
you know, and there are loads of characters from throughout the film, characters who he is wrong, characters who he hasn't shown the love, love to, you know, his, his relationship with him and his father is really well done. There's this really good character, I don't even know his name, but um, he he meets him and he's like, hey guy, I like your nurse's uniform. And he's like, they're OR scrubs. And it's like, oh, are they? And it's just like, and they have this weird like little like tense scene. And then the end he comes back and he was like, oh yeah, they requ- he requested that I wear a suit. And yeah, yeah. it's just ev- everything matters. And I think that's it, it's such a tight script. Um, mm-hmm. But the problem with it then is that Max doesn't get with the teacher, obviously, because she's like 10 yeah, years older than obviously. me, maybe even yeah. more. But he does, you know, find friendship in Margaret Young, who is a character he meets when he briefly uh, is at another school, not Rushmore. But you don't really feel their friendship. And I, that was a problem to me. I feel like you can't reward a character with something that we don't really understand. Yeah, I thought that that was a bit, you know, that it, it, it was weird to have that relationship, you know, like Max trying to get the teacher. I thought, you know, it was it wasn't really. Yeah, that's I think that's another reason why I connect, connected to the story was like, oh, mm. him trying to get the teacher. But, you know, obviously that looks wrong on so many levels. But, <laughs> but yeah. you ever you ever fancy the teacher? Huh? Have you ever fancied a teacher? Uh, no. No. Yeah, I don't think no. I have either. No. Um, but but yeah, I think there is a definitely a another motif of unconventional love throughout Wes Anderson's films as well. Yeah. Which but definitely I mean, um <clears throat> that goes I know what you mean. You're like it goes like yeah. takes that weird subject, but then you know, does it a bit you know on his side you know what i mean like what he does with it yeah i think everything is twisted it's it's, yeah yeah because i guess it's all it's all inside wes's brain and because of that you get this you know such an interesting thing but but yeah i think rushmore you know i think i think it's well deserved to be his first real hit i mean it started his relationship with bill murray and with jason Schwartzman. i think that's really cool Especially since Bill Murray's been in everything I want since then. And uh, uh, another thing that to add is that you know Owen Wilson always finds a way to be in his films. Yes. <laughs> well, Owen Wilson he's... in in this one, he he wrote it. He co-wrote it with Wes. Oh wow! Really? He co-wrote yeah. it. Yeah. Wait. So That's Wes cool. and um, Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson were roommates at college. Oh, they were roommates. And, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and they. Like they wrote this together and they wrote Boss Rocket together. And obviously Owen Wilson stars in all but three, I think, of Wes Anderson's films. And one of those was Rushmore, which he co-wrote, which I think is really cool. Mm. Right. Okay. Yeah, so what's next on your list? This is uh, number seven for me and number six for you. I thought it would be... Yeah, well, I haven't seen Isle of Dogs or Moonrise Kingdom, so that would be Yes, yeah, so that'll, that'll, make, that'll make six uh, on, your, oh, on six. your list and seven for me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, do, 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 what was it? What was it? Uh, okay. Um, you don't have your list written down. <laughs> no, I do. It, no, it's just okay. like... Right, we're right, trying to find it. Uh, I do. It, uh, do, do, do. Oh, okay. So... Um, I was having a hard decision to like okay. what was the other films that I really like. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were some really good ones like Darjeeling Limited and The Life Aquatic yeah. and yeah. Grand yeah. Budapest. So um, I want to see The World Tenenbaums. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, well, well, yeah. I've got Bottle Rocket. So let's oh, wait right. and see. Um, so what's next on your list? We'll wait and see if we can cross over at some point. Uh, Oh yeah, Bottle Rocket. Well, my number my number six is Royal Tenenbaums. So we'll talk about Rock Bottle Rocket first, and then we'll do Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, okay, okay. So Bottle Rocket. Wow, this one. Uh, this is my fa- Yeah, fifth. Yeah, this is my fifth. Um, so Bottle Rocket. Uh, this one I enjoyed. You know, this is like one of the first films, and we I talked about it on the pod a couple of weeks ago, didn't I? But I'm like yes, to talk about it again. Uh, but this one just you know, was really cool, you know, like having that whole uh, comedic uh, dry humour uh, camera and then the keeper and especially 
uh, that I've been recommending people to watch this film. You know, it's one of his first films, you know, uh, Wes uh, ever did. So um, I really like the characters in this one. It was just like hilarious to have throughout the film, you know, with some uh, really funny dialogue that I really liked. Um, yeah, the story. Yeah, I, I go on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah no, you, no, you. I yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. what I always love about most directors is that you can always see in their very first film what they, you know, like where it all started, you know, and yeah. you can see how things in the later films kind of were born. Man, that's what I love about Bottle Rocket. It's so early, mm. but how, I mean, imagine being in college and writing that. <laughs> That's incredible. That's so, so good. I mean, we obviously, for our second ever episode of the podcast, we talked about Christopher Nolan's films and we talked about Following, which is his first oh, yeah, film. Following. And that's mad. Yeah. And do you know what I discovered this week? Yeah. Shaun of the Dead is not Edgar Wright's first film. What? <laughs> What? There's another film that he made called A Fistful of Fingers, which is a, a parody of Westerns, and it was never released on DVD or Blu-ray. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, it, wait. I know, right? So it, uh, it's not Shaun of the Dead. It's not Spaced. His first directorial thing was Fistful of Fingers. Oh, my God. Th- that's the, exactly th- the exact same uh, title for Fistful full of dollars i don't know it was like yes it is that's that that yeah that's the idea the idea is it's a parody of fistful of dollars um and it's on youtube as well so i'm gonna watch it at some point right okay Um, it's on youtube yeah oh my god so Uh, yeah it's it's not uh, not been released anywhere else but if anyone's interested and they want to before last night in soho want to brush up on the edgar wright it's one that i hadn't heard of until like three days ago so it blew my mind and yeah mad oh my god there's not a lot of people watch this oh wow um Mm. So, okay. <laughs> That's, I'm just uh, shaking up everything. Nothing oh my God, is real. Because, you know, having seen Shaun of the Dead, you know, having that thing was like, you know, really hilarious, mind-blowing, you know, that whole um, yeah. camera work trope, you know, you've seen that with it uh, fast editing, cross, I don't know, it's not cross cutting. I don't know, but like, a close up of like transitions in the next scene, or you know, having that montage, you know, that mini montage in West, um, not West Edgar Wright's films. So, yes, yeah, so good. Yeah. Maybe one day so, we'll talk about all of Edgar Wright's films. Oh, yeah, that's gonna be great as well. Uh, yeah, but, mm, mm. but yeah, Bottle Rocket. So, so, something that struck me is, um, and I think this is basically what Martin Scorsese says if anyone's read the essay that he wrote on the film. Is that oh, it's oh yeah, you'll be I'm sure you'll be able to find it somewhere. Um or I'll let you borrow the, the little booklet that comes in the cart- oh, criterion the book. right. Hey. The little booklet. Um but he says, you know, it's about, you know, young men who really don't know, you know, what to do and they you know, they spend their time, you know, trying to, you know, create some semblance of meaning. They you know, the, the whole time in this in this film, Dignan is is you know trying to pull heists. You know, he just got out of this kind of rehab, and he's trying to pull heists. He's trying to, you know, create some kind of impact and some spark in his life. And I think that's really impactful. You know, mm. you know, as yeah. somebody who it is, you know, not too far off from the age of the characters. You know, early twenties. I think it. You know, you don't really know who you are or what you know. Like what you really want to do, and I think I think the idea that that manifests in Dignan's insecurity, and you know Anthony wants to find love, and Bob just wants to have people who like him. I think those three characters are so strong, you know, and obviously they they they, they find, you know, what they think they find. In some cases, you know, Anthony finds love um, at the hotel uh, or the motel. Uh, yeah, and Bob obviously mean. like has his kind of like abusive relationship with his brother and Dignan, you know, keeps on trying to find somebody who he can look up to and somebody who can, who can help him out, you know, before yeah. realizing that it was his friends all along. Beautiful. All along. I think that's, you know, really powerful message throughout, you know, West Anderson's films, you know, like how you can see the story 
uh, you know, ridiculous, but also simple at the same time. You know, like it doesn't, you know, stories don't need to be complex, but, you know, having that simple story, but, you know, giving out like that extra push into it, you know, like that having that dramatic and emotional push into it, that's like how you do it. Especially like in the life aquatic, you know, at the beginning, it's just like, um, uh, you know, um, Bill Murray, you know, uh, voice saving, you know, what happened to Esteban. Rest in peace, rest- <laughs> Esteban. Yes. Esteban. Oh my God, uh, yeah, but, killed, by, killed by the shark. Uh, killed by the shark. But, you know, like, the story is the guy is trying to, fa- trying to find the, the one who killed um, Esteban, the shark. Yeah. He needs to find the tiger shark. And, uh-huh. um, you know, that is just sounds so funny but you know it's just like you know jaws but you know having that hilarious take on it but you know and the cool thing right i'm, I'm really excited to talk about the life quite but it's so cool but um you know it's just like that ha- having that story you know you can make it how to experiment it you know like what you can do with it and that's where we like in mm-hmm. bar it you know having that idea yeah. of like two people having no idea what they're doing with their 75 year plan and oh yeah uh, i mean it, like it's all it's all you know manifested like dig dignan especially in bottle rocket his you know his need to plan everything out and do these heists is a reflection of his own you know mental insecurities i guess kind of mm. and, I, and i think i think that is a really good thing in wes anderson's films that you know as you said with life aquatic you know people have these inner insecurities that manifest themselves, you know, in things like trying to catch a shark or, you know, trying to like do a bank heist, something, you know, that kind of stuff. Or in Dignan's case, a bookstore heist, that kind of stuff, <laughs> I think works really, really well. Um, and Wes, Wes Anderson, I think his use of music is so well. Um, yeah, music. It, oh, especially at the end the of it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I can. You're excited to talk about life quite can't you? Yeah. I, um, it's not my favorite, but it's just really cool to talk about. Oh, um, it, it, it's a good one. Um, yeah, it's a good one. In, in Bottle Rocket, there's a sequence just before spoilers, Dignan gets arrested. Um, he, like, he's running from the cops to the song 2000 Man, which I think uh, is really, really, yeah. I think it's a really, really good sequence of him kind of like, you know, accepting it. Yeah. And also, and in, 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 you know, like doing the right thing, you know, to kind of save his friends and, and understanding that his time's kind of run out, but he's still going to make a, you know, he's still yeah. going to make a scene of it in ways. And like how you, you know, you've seen this character throughout the film, like, oh, he's got to escape, he's got to escape. But, you know, um, I, you know, I, yeah, I, you know, how funny the film is, but I think, you know, I think, you know, with Wes Anderson films, it goes to you know back to reality of it you know you know how how that grounded take to it you know what i mean so yes, yeah 100 percent um so should we talk about royal ten and bounds then oh i'd say um, yeah bottle rocket i'd give a nine out of ten i would say oh yeah nine out of ten i agree as well it's yeah, just that you know I, the, yeah go on. i don't know what i don't know what the nine out of ten but i think yeah i feel like it is a nine out of ten so yeah i couldn't like it's difficult for me to critique a lot of these films because I, you know, something about Wes Anderson in, in, in the, as it says in literally the title of the video, I think he's a genius. And I think that the, the things that he says in the comments oh, yeah, he has yeah, he's a genius. On, on reality, he, he, he has things to say that resonate with me. And the only reason I would give Bottle Rocket a nine is I feel like it's not quite emotional with the others, which, you know... Oh. But, yeah. you know that's fine it doesn't have to be but for me you know if i'm ranking all of them i would say this is belief is one of them not as emotional yeah. as it is um yeah so let's talk about royal tenenbaums the royal tenenbaums um the funny thing about the royal tenenbaums is that i didn't know ben stiller wasn't it no oh yeah like ben chats. stiller oh yeah you know it's funny um i don't see a lot of you know Ben still in comedies, uh, but you know he. I don't see him in a, a lot of films, uh, but he's a great actor. You know, like yeah, he, I, he, I, he, I struggle to remember the last time that I saw Ben Stiller in a film. Um, the only thing I can remember is just the Secret Life of Ultimacy. 
brilliant film. Uh, and he directed that, I think, or wrote that. Yeah, he did. That's right. Yeah, he directed it. I don't know about right. Uh, I don't know if he wrote it, but I know he directed it. Yeah. And it's such a good film, you know, like, I really like actors, you know, having their own creative control, you know, you know, being working through the film industry and having that important story um, to go after what's with you. But no, um, I, is this the, one of the first few films that Ben Stiller's been in, like the World Tenenbaums? Well, it must have been early. I mean, this film, interestingly, has quite a few. Oh, there goes a police. Um, sorry, I don't know if you hear that, but this interesting has quite a few um, actors who, I mean, obviously Wes Anderson, like a lot of directors, worked with a lot of the same people. Obviously, Bill Murray, uh, mm-hmm. Jason Schwartzman, Adrian Brody, and Jennifer Houston. You know, those kind of people. But this one has Ben Stiller, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Gene Hackman, all of whom, to my knowledge, aren't in any of the other Wes Anderson films. Which I think- yeah, and it's, it's crazy because Ben Stiller in this one is just like... A completely, you know, different person, and you know, I know I wish that he was in a lot more films because you know his acting is just hilarious. You know, like what he does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, it, it was weird. You know, you don't see those actors again throughout Wes Anderson films because you know it's weird how uh, they bring you know the uh, you know Wes brings back you know the old actors and they have a completely yeah. different role. And then nail yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think I think he knows how to use them really, really well. Um, and as I say, in a similar way to No Two, Wes Anderson films are the same. I would also say No Two, Wes Anderson roles are, which I think is really cool. I mean, interestingly, Gene Hackman, who plays Royal, he hated doing this film. He really struggled oh, with what? it. Oh, what? Oh, but yeah, he didn't like working with with Wes. You know, all of that, and that's probably why he didn't come back for another one. But I think he did a great job as Royal, you know, this father who, mm. you know, wants to um, kind of like reconnect with his family. Yeah. You know, and Especially, does it through you know, wacky um, needs. You know, having that hard time, you know, trying to reconnect, you know, especially that this is the one big family. Um, and, you know, the character... Um, I forgot his name. He has six, six, six weeks to live and, you know, having that emotional connection. And, you know... Uh, is that, really is that not how... Royal? Yeah, that's Royal. Yeah, Royal. Yeah, I, yeah. My yeah. brain decided to go, oh, John, <laughs> think of someone else. Uh, no, it, it's Royal. Yeah, Royal, you know, having that six weeks to live. And, you know, it's funny once you see, like, a trailer of it and you just go, oh, this is really funny. But then, like... Ten and Barnes goes into a really um, depressing, you know, like yeah, uh, s- sense of the characters, especially one scene that was like so. Yeah, th- this could be hard to watch. Wes Anderson's most real film. Yeah, you know the the character. I mean, obviously, ooh, what's the guy's oh, name? That Reggie? was just um the the uh, the. The, the child or the, the sibling member of the family played by yeah. Luke Wilson. His oh, scene yeah. where, he, where he attempts suicide, oh. I think, is a really, really brutal scene and really yeah. you know, impactful. Richie, not Reggie, Richie. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, that was, uh... yeah, that, that, that hits hard. I think, I think there aren't scenes like that in other Wes Anderson films where, you know, you, I mean, obviously, there are loads of emotions, but I think there are some dark themes in this one. You know, yeah. you know, like the, the you know the whole like theme of like you know a family separated. You know, and all the in in various ways, all the family are abusing themselves. You know, yeah. Richie has given up his career as a tennis player and has you know, and 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 has kind of like you know just left on a boat. And 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 yeah. Margot is in an unhappy marriage, and and Chas lost his wife, and so spends the whole time, you know, guilty over her death and wanting to, you know, protect his kids over that. Yeah, and it's a, like the most real film, you know, you, you go through it with Wes, and you know, I really like, you know, you learn about more about the characters, 
throughout the film uh, on a like an emotional scale and like how it links all together like um i mean with the other west end of west end of films you do learn about the characters but in a more hilarious way but this one just felt you know realistic you know uh what west wanted intended to do so mm, yeah definitely and again you you also see some of the unlikely love that you get in most of his films in Rushmore, it's uh, Max and the teacher in Bottle Rocket. It's it's Anthony finding love at the motel, and in Royal Tenenbaums, it's, it's Richie and Margot obviously being adopted siblings. And you know, Richie feels like Margot's the only one who he's ever been able to fully connect with. He's drawn pictures of her ever since she was a kid. Um, they were kids, should I say? Mm. And it's. It's done really sensitively, you know. Yeah. You, you watch it, and, and, and instead of thinking, oh, it's a little bit incestual, you instead think, like, oh, these people really, you know, do find something in themselves, in, in, in each other. But, you know, there is that, you know, feeling of that they won't, that they won't be able to be together, you know. And I think, I think that's done really well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, I can't remember the music. I don't think I had music on. I, I don't know because uh, I, I was watching it on Disney Plus. I, I, think right. the mu- I can't remember the music. I thought the music, because it, I, I just watched it days ago. I can't remember the music that well. But, yeah. Um, there's normally good music in Wes Anderson films, but I, I agree. I can't really think of anything too standouty in this one. And I think I, I would give this one a nine out of 10 again. And I think that's that would be my problem with it. I don't think there's too much in the music. That yeah, is is memorable, but the one thing that you know really obviously stands out, you know, the whole message of the film, you know, like about family, not Vin Diesel, just you know, family <laughs> about like how each one goes. Wait, wait, Vin Diesel needs to be in a Wes Anderson film. Oh my! We, just, God. we need we need to see that that collaboration. I want to see. No, not gonna lie, I actually want to see that. You know how Wes wants Vin Diesel to act or in this scene, you know. What possible Vin Diesel do? cannot act <laughs> the car <laughs> like mix just fixing the car and just like yeah family <laughs> uh, but the, you know obviously rest, uh, you know the main message you know like each family member goes through the demons you know uh, what they're going through and, uh, and it's really powerful I think this is the most powerful Wes Anderson film you know definitely uh, but it's also a yeah. bit crazy um Owen Wilson's character at the end, <laughs> he arrives at the wedding with like his face painted and he's in a car yeah. and he just drives into the house. And it's the weirdest thing. Uh, like uh, it's well, very it's thematically almost... relevant with with yeah. Chas's arc and the death of the dog, um, which really was heartbreaking. And the way that Chas, you know. You know, the way that the Royal saves the kids and, you know, Chas and Royal make up, you know, it's beautiful. A Royal death at the end and the fact that Chas was the only one with him in the ambulance. I think that's a really nice, you know, father-son connection. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was great. I really like that one. Nine out of ten for me as well. So, yeah. yeah. So now moving on to number five. So my number five, your number th- three? Four? Yeah, three. Three, okay. Um, so I've got the Darjeeling Limited. Oh right, um, uh, I have the Life Aquatic. Or oh, okay, <laughs> this is a hard decision. I don't want because I really enjoy these both, but there's like really other good ones. No, Grand Budapest. I'm gonna say Grand Budapest. No, ah, okay. uh, no. I wait, this know. can't. Wait, 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 wait. This, this, this has this has to be your fourth, right? Okay, fourth. Right, you've so got, got four. You've got four left, not three. Yes, I've got Grand Am I right? Yes, yeah, okay. Yes, Fantastic Fan- Mr. Fox, The Darjeeling yes. Express, and The Life Aquatic. Yes, that's right. Darjeeling Limited. Uh, these are really hard to rank because I really thoroughly enjoy these. Yes, I am. Uh, yeah, I get you. So yes, I, I'm, I've got um, Darjeeling Limited as my next one. Right, and let's you talk had about Life Darjeeling. Aquatic. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about Darjeeling. Yeah, let's talk about that because okay. these are Wait, really what, 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 where yeah. was that ranked? Where was that ranked on yours? Sorry, well, where was that ranked on yours? Um, three, the no, four, the Darjeeling Express. Okay. 
Cool. Uh, Dar- cool. Darjeeling Limited. Oh my God. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's all going you know, wrong. It's all going crazy over here. All right, the Darjeeling Limited. The, the reason why I say it Express because it's just on the train and it's just decided to go, hey, think of the Polar Express, but then the Darjeeling Limited and then it just comes together as the Darjeeling Express. You know what? I'll take but, that. I think we're done as a director Christmas film. That would be really fun. Yeah, that would be really fun. Uh, but let's talk about the Darjeeling Limited. Let's do it. So last time I watched all of Wes Anderson's film, which was last year, this is my favourite. And obviously this time it's at number five, so it's pretty in the middle. But I think this is a very, very good film. Yeah, very good one. And the one thing that was really... Wait, was this filmed on the train? Uh, Presumably. Maybe. Like the, entire, the entirety? Because you have to... Uh, I got you the book of it, didn't I? Yes. And was that was it really true that it was actually on a train, you know, like with what they filmed? I don't know Not- yet, because I haven't I haven't read the Dodge Limited bit yet. I've been working through them as I've been watching them, but obviously oh. like, I've also I've also been trying to read Dune and oh my god. And I, it's so it's so oh, it's so boring. Oh god. Dune is a boring book, I can tell you that much. Um mm. but yeah, so I wish I had the answer to you, but I have no idea. Um, but I think having this film set on a train is it's a quite interesting poetry for the characters characters who are all kind of travelling through their lives and all different points of their lives and you know going from one place to the next trying to figure out you know uh, or, or I can't remember the names but you know one of them's trying to escape their pregnant wife one of them's just trying to kind of like find their mum and the other one is trying to write and you know unsure whether they're going to you know, meet uh, their girlfriend. Fun fact, Wes Anderson made a, a, a short film called Hotel Chevalier, right? Oh, yeah. I saw that Which, on the thing on here on my yes. uh, Google. I was, like, looking to see. Well, just that's, in that is supposed to be, um, like, this. that is set before it, and it's about... Uh, Jason Schwartzman character Jack with his girlfriend played by Natalie Portman who is at the end of the film um, and yeah. they and that is like their meeting that Jack then writes as a play at the end of the film it's beautiful poetry no way. yeah it's cool that's so cool I wish directors sometimes do that well I mean like you know to give more expan- expansion you know with their, with their story and films that is so cool yeah, and that was I made agree. in 2007, so... Yeah, so that's that same year. It was going to be the opening of the film, but then they've decided that it was too um, separate Long? from the main... Yeah, separate oh, from yeah. the main plot. So they decided right. not to. So, Chev... Wait, I need to look on YouTube. Chevalier... Yeah, I need to watch it too. Um, uh, West. I feel like a fake fan because I haven't seen it. Uh, even though uh, I've seen all the other... Oh, the yeah, films. 30 minutes. Oh, it's on blue. Oh, right. Decent. Yes, it is. You, uh, it comes in the um, Darjeeling Unlimited uh, Criterion Blu-ray. So one day... Wait, I'll, there's a I'll Criterion collection it. of Darjeeling Unlimited? Well, Wes, no Anderson, Wes, Anderson, Wes Anderson has a, uh, a deal <laughs> with the Criterion collection, so all of his films are on uh, Criterion Blu-rays. Uh, they haven't released Isle of Dogs yet, but all the other ones are on there. So yeah, oh, currently okay. I have the okay. first three, and I'm I'm venturing to buy them all. Ah, uh, but the the one uh, Criterion uh, film I've got right now is oh they got Left Credit on Criterion Collection, no way. Yeah, they got them all. Um, um, I've got the Tree of Life on my oh, yeah, yeah, Criterion. I remember, you, I remember you telling me about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Can't wait to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm excited to talk about it because it's, it says experimental film, but it doesn't look too experimental because I'm a bit worried about like some experimental films I've seen, especially that we're looking through in film studies. Right. So, yeah. There's some yeah. real, real corkers out there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Darjeeling. Yeah. So this, uh, this was really good. <laughs> I really enjoyed yeah, it. You know, the characters, uh, you know, what you said about, you know, um, you know, they're going through different pinpoints in time, you know, where they are. 
and it, it uh, yeah it is quite poetry you know i agree with you as well and it's hilarious you know about like you know it's really cool you know yeah well as you said you know uh that west ends and you know different takes on different aesthetic and different countries as well you know this one's set in india yes. and that's really cool you know like they're doing like different locations especially like you know uh the life aquatic was you know under the water uh you know some you know very posh places as well um that you know dodging limited was on, on the indian train grand Budapest is in a hotel you know like in i don't know where it, it doesn't look like germany or wash i just i forgot the oh place. yeah I think, I think it's an i think it's in a fictional um country yes i might be i might be wrong but yeah good stuff um, yeah you're completely eat. right it, it, it's so cool to you know be you know exploring all these different elements obviously this is the fifth wes anderson film and what I love about it is the way that it it kind of like how to, how how best to describe it like the visual motifs become a lot more prevalent. And what I mean by that is there's a really really good mirroring from the beginning and the end of the film. The beginning mm. opens, and I think it's an amazing opening with Bill Murray running for the train, and yeah. in slow motion, Adrian Brody's character um, Peter like runs past him like in yeah. slow motion and like Bill Murray doesn't get the train but like Adrian Brody does and bearing in mind they both have like carrying like, loads of suitcases and then the end of the film when the three brothers have to get back on the train uh, well it's not the same train but like another train they all like run but they all get they all drop their luggage so they can make the train and it's like it's it's like visual like it's a visual representation of all the characters letting go of their emotional luggage in order to, um, in order to, you know, progress in their lives, and I love that stuff. I think it's so, so cool. Uh, yeah, that's uh, really, really cool. Uh, so, uh, my, my dad was like texts, texts something about something. Um, but yeah, about like how, um, you know, uh, symbolic it is, you know, throughout the film, and you know, um, how it creates, you know, in a more emotion with these characters, because, you know, at the beginning, it's more comedic, you know, trying to get on the train, doing something, but then it gives more impact, you know, at the end of the film, you know, what they've been through, especially, you know, you know, um, Muslim's characters, just like all messed, uh, faces just all messed up, you know, with bandages and, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, I love the scene where he takes off his bandages for mm. revealing himself as vulnerable, kind of for the first yeah. time in the film. The, you, as you said with um, Royal Tenenbaums, it's all about family. In 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 the West Anderson films, there's a there is that recurring motif of family, and what I love about that is that, like, you get this relationship between the brothers that culminates in this really nice scene where they see their mum, and they all just look at each other. Mm. You know the scene they mean, and they're all looking at each other and they're all crying. I think it's a really, really cool scene. Yeah, like you know, really impacts you know throughout the film. You know, yeah, yeah, and you know, I like you know uh, the Indian uh, religion to it as well. You know, like they go into yes um, different uh, religious places as well, and um, you know how it further takes on the characters a bit more you know what they're trying to do you know trying to get on this journey to reconnect together so yeah yeah uh, I, I i agree with you there's really really cool you know stuff with that like where they go to the village and they have to share, save the children you get a really nice you know role from if if iran if iran khan uh who oh, unfortunately rest of them is dead now so you know rest in peace for him but you know he's uh, like a really big actor in India. He was in Jurassic World and um, Amazing Spider-Man. So, like, you know, and Life of Pi, I think. I haven't seen that film once. But, but yeah, like, I think there are some really nice ways to do that. And, again, they all use, they use these moments to kind of progress the characters of the, of the three brothers, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, and I really like that. Um, I I am really so sorry so sorry right now because I've got I've got to go so, somewhere right now because my parents are telling me that there's an important 
party thing with my family, I think. So oh, okay. Um so um okay, so my final three. Um yeah. Uh I'm gonna quickly do it now. Um, uh, you know, cool. Life Aquatic, um, Grand Budapest, uh, uh no wait, Fantastic Mr. Fox and Grand, Grand Budapest. Um, Life Aquatic was, you know, really hilarious, you know, with um the whole story with um Esteban, um you know, like dying and then having that more uh, serious father and son relationship between um, Ned and uh, um, Saizu. I, I forgot his first name. I did. It's, it's his first name, Saizu. Steve. Um, yeah. Steve. Yes, yeah, Steve Saizu. You know, Steve. like having that important relationship. Steve. Uh, and D- uh, Wilhelm Defoe was in this. So, yeah, first yes, time was. seeing him in there. Wilhelm Defoe uh, starting his uh, like career with, uh, with, with Wes Anderson. He's in quite like three or four of his films now, which is really cool. Um, yeah, and uh, it, it it's really it, it's really it's really a good film. So um, and then Fantasy Mr. Fox, I really enjoyed that. That was my first Wes Anderson film I ever saw in the cinemas. That was really cool with the animation style. I'm really sorry that I'm rushing right now, but you can finish the whole That's thing. Right. And then Grand Budapest Hotel, yeah. Yeah, uh, really. Uh, that was my second time seeing the Grand uh, West Anderson film. You know, with the cinematography. You know how it really adds that comedic style to it. You know about that whole taste to it. You know what what is doing. You know having that full fleshed um, uh, take to it. So yeah, uh, right. I'm so sorry. I must go. No, so. that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll all see you next week for Venom. Let there be carnage. Okay. Right. All right. Um, Goodbye. Right. Goodbye. See you. <laughs> well, it's just me now, folks. Um, and yeah, I have a second what what John says about life aquatic. I think there's. A, I think it's really, um, a really successful, you know, example of like balancing comedy with emotions. I think there's a really nice scene at the end where they're all the crew of Team Zisu are in are in a submarine look, and they find the tiger. F- tiger shark and you know they all come together over the death of of ned and i think i think i think it's absolutely beautiful um my number so that was my number four as well um, but my number three was actually mirai's kingdom uh one that john didn't see um but i think so many reasons it, it, it's incredible there is a childlike innocence to the way that they i mean literally with like the main like rom- romance being between like however old they are like 12 year olds and i think it's done so wonderfully and so tenderly i think it really really works and you know it's not like it doesn't feel weird it it feels like there is a genuine love between these people um but there are some really like iconic you know characters and like i think all the parents you know you've got bruce willis and edward norton and and francis mcdormand and and uh, Bill Murray is all the parents kind of and, and like guardians looking to the kids as they kind of go off on this adventure. And I think, you know, it's about like independence and like, you know, real love and find and having a found family. I think that worked really well. My number two, obviously, Grand Budapest. What I love most about that is obviously Ray Fiennes as um, Gustav is so, so good. He's he's like Paddington. I don't like, he, he he's like Paddington. He makes everyone like he treats everyone with like kindness and respect um of course he's got a bit more of an edge to him than Paddington but like he's so nice and there are so many brilliant moments of him like when he you know you know Zero breaks him out of out of uh prison and he's like oh give me the lead of Panache and, and Zero's like I've got the lead of Panache he's like Zero I, I've been in prison for ages and I stink I can't believe you forgot the, the lead of Panache some of these things are just so well done and then number one what what can I even say? John had it as a number two. Number one for me is Fantastic Mr. Fox. I mean, come on. The mother of all adaptations. It'd be really difficult for me to find a better adaptation of a book, maybe Lord of the Rings. But wow, the animation is beautiful. The cast that they bring in, I think this might be the only one where Wes Anderson himself plays a role, which I think is really cool. But you've got George Clooney and Michael Gambon and Mel Streep. Loads of different amazing actors coming together. But it is just this film about difference you know ash his fatness the fox's son 
thinks you know he's different he thinks it's a bad thing but you know it's relevant to this and that's a good thing and mr fox he's fantastic but he's also different and you know people love and hate him and, and the way that he gets out of situations and he wants to be more than he is it's it's no more brilliantly portrayed in, in a beautiful beautiful kind of sleep is seen when he sees the wolf he's always been fearful of wolf and about the animalistic side but he fully embraces that and that he's a wild animal but that he can still do something with himself and his life you know I just think it's an absolutely beautiful film and brilliantly. I mean, how did it not win the Oscar that year? Yeah, sure, it was going up against Up, but I'm not the first to say that Up, it's not as good after you get that past that first, you know, 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, that's the Wes Anderson ranking. Um, shame that John had to leave us, but honestly, I had I had a good time. We will be doing French Dispatch uh, in about mid-November. We were going to do it earlier, but we decided let's do Dune first, because obviously Dune is, is one that... We're very excited to talk about. I still need to finish half the book. I'm telling you, I really no idea how I'm going to get through it. Um, and obviously, John's not here again, so I'm not going to do uh, the weekly viewing. So this is probably the shortest episode ever of the podcast. But you know, thank you everyone for watching. Um, if you have anything to say about Wes Anderson's films, what's you know, what's your ranking? What do you think about any of them? Do you agree with our placements? You know, do you think that Tana and Mr. Fox and Grand Be the Best is, is the best, or I Love Dogs and Rushmore? Do you think they're his weakest? Do you like him as a filmmaker or not? comment it below or give us an email so email us at gmail.com much appreciate that or you can tweet us or just follow us on twitter or instagram at our time or follow me on twitter at tom the boardman i already think i might stop i mean john already stopped doing that but i i, th I think i might um i think i might as well because i don't really use it but yeah if you like this video give it a thumbs up because it just makes sense in the words of jack howard it just makes sense doesn't it um and I think that's everything. Next week, we're going to be doing Venom again. Not 2018, don't worry. We're doing Venom Like Lady Carnage, uh, which is coming out next week in the UK. Um, so, yes, and without further ado, take what you're given. And I'm alone, so I guess I would just have to say, give nothing back. Goodbye.